Welcome to the Crypto and Blockchain Talk. Hello. Hey. Hello. 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 Namaste. Nihau. Vivet. Hello. Salut. Yassas. Salve. Ciao. Bonjour. Our podcast talks about the latest trends in the worlds of cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Crypto and Blockchain Talk. And I am very excited today because with me, I have the founder of an amazing project called the Divi Project. And the man I have with me, his name is Nick Saponaro. So in the first instance, let's welcome Nick. Nick, welcome to Crypto and Blockchain Talk. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Oh, I'm excited to have you here. I love having really cool, intelligent people on my program. I definitely think you fit the bill. My name is Aviva Onop. I am the host of Crypto and Blockchain Talk, and I'd like to welcome all of our listeners to this exciting episode. So, Nick, we can't ignore the elephant that is still in the room, and we have no idea when this elephant is going to stomp off. And we all know that that elephant is what's happening in an area of the world known as Ukraine. And at the current moment in time, well, we can see that Bitcoin is now rising. It's rising because there are Russians who are now starting to utilize Bitcoin, who haven't started to use Bitcoin before, who haven't used Bitcoin before. So there has been a little bit of, I want to say adoption, adoption by fire, if I can say that. Of course, Ukrainians as well are using Bitcoin as they flee and pour into neighboring nations. So there has been this increase in terms of Bitcoin usage and Bitcoin purchasing. I mean, it's not yet matched the 60 plus thousand that we saw some time ago, but we can see that there's been an increase. Now, would you say that you agree with these articles that the increase in Bitcoin, in the price of Bitcoin, is from what's happening in that area of the world? Or do you think that there's maybe something else that's also ha- happening at play here? I think what we're witnessing potentially for the first time is basically the crowdsourcing of freedom. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's interesting to watch. I think there are a lot of Ukrainians and Russians alike purchasing Bitcoin for the first time. Um, But I also think there's a lot of people outside of that geopolitical sphere that are speculating on the fact that Ukrainians and Russians are buying Bitcoin. So you're seeing a market effect both from the true adoption of the asset as well as people, you know, jumping in and and, and speculating that it will continue to go up as uh, as this conflict continues. It's a little strange to, like, capitalize on something like that. But nonetheless, I think that's what's happening. Yeah, it is. It is a sad thing. And yesterday on a podcast that uh, will be released shortly, actually, we were talking about people who are capitalizing on other people's misery, because there's, of course, a lot of scams now that have arisen by people who are posing either as Ukrainians who have lost all of their possessions, saying that they've lost all their possessions, going on social media, getting donations uh, through uh, crypto donations, And of course, these people are scammers, and it turns out that they are nowhere even near that part of the world. And uh, Avast, who who are the security experts, uh, on Avast's blog, they've actually gone out of their way to actually, I don't want to say hunt down, that sounds sounds a little too aggressive. They've gone out of their way to track who these people are on social media, and they've isolated areas of the world where they are. And people, for some reason, have... I don't understand this myself, and I don't want to make myself out to sound like, you know, I, I'm an angel placed down on earth from heaven, but I would never look at a situation like this and think, how can I profit? It's kind of interesting, actually, that people do have that viewpoint. But in this time of conflict, like you just said, you agreed with me that people are hedging bets that both sides of this war, Russians and Ukrainians, are going to be perhaps we you know no one knows for sure really anything which side crypto is helping do you think that during this time crypto is going to help one side or the other even more does it look like and so this is a two-pronged question do you think that crypto is helping one or the other side more and the second question is do you believe that 
sanctions are in any way, and I'm talking financial sanctions in terms of being barred from SWIFT, the SWIFT banking system, if that ever happens, they haven't been barred from SWIFT. I know they're pushing for it. But I, I have seen that. I mean, we have employees in Belarus, right? Mm-hmm. We weren't able to send them wire transfers for their paychecks just yesterday. So some of the banking systems are definitely being, and I don't know if that's as a result of sanctions or it's the banks taking, you know, a pragmatic approach, but things are happening for sure. There's been an effect on the banking system already. I guess my two-pronged question, because I'm going to have you answer both of these if you, if you don't mind, is the Russian-Ukrainian conflict being helped by crypto is one side being helped more and then do you think that the sanctions and like like you said you just tried to send money to your to your employees who are over in belarus do you think that these financial sanctions are going to really make any difference to russia when of course we have crypto yes i mean whether or not it's helping one side or the other more is remains to be seen but what we'll say is Something is being proven now, which is that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are unbiased. They don't care about geopolitical conflicts. They don't care about centralized powers. Of course, this this threat of Jesse, um, you know, they're the only thing that regulates crypto in reality is the code that it's written in. Right. There are vehicles by which we utilize cryptocurrency, like exchanges and wallets, things like that. And those custodial services can be, of course, regulated. But the, the actual code itself, the actual functionality of, of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency is borderless and, and doesn't care, right? And, and like I said, I don't, I don't know that one side is being helped more than the other, but I do know that Russians who are in Russia and disagreeing with the conflict, watching their, all of their assets tank, uh, their rubles you know, going down 30 or 40 percent in value, having an asset to flee to that does store value like, like Bitcoin is a remarkable thing. Similarly with Ukraine, you know, allowing opportunity to, like I said before, crowdsource this conflict in a way, whether you agree with it or not, it's, it's able to happen as a result of cryptocurrency. So, yeah, I mean, the, sh- the sanctions can come down. The SWIFT system could literally disappear to exist, which will only impact the on-ramps and off-ramps to and from cryptocurrency. But those that have crypto already are clearly willing to assist in getting those that need it, their assets, which is which is an interesting sort of vindication of the theory uh, around around cryptocurrency. And uh, again, whether you agree with it or not, it's happening. Using crypto in the middle of a crisis like this, do you think it's going to be easy for people who are now in countries they're displaced and in other countries? Do you think that it's going to be easy for them to use crypto? in that kind of a circumstance obviously if you're in the country of ukraine and all their connections and uh, communications are being cut and you know working devices are possibly in question and of course we've seen that apple has stopped the shipment of all i products iphones ipads whatever all of their products are now shut off from being delivered to Russia. They did this, I think, yesterday. Doesn't this really put a hamper in terms of adoption when some very intrinsic parts to, and I'm not saying that if you don't have an iPhone, (laughs) you can't do crypto, but, you know, iPhones are very popular and many people actually do use those. And I'm not sure about what the other companies are doing in terms of, you know, the Android providers and God only knows if anyone's using a BlackBerry anymore. But the whole point is, (laughs) is that, you know, is this is it is it going to be easy for them, regardless if you're in Russia or the Ukraine? It's definitely getting harder. Um, I think the sad part about sanctions and sort of the reaction of large corporations and things like that. The sad part is it impacts Russian people who have no desire to be in this conflict whatsoever. That said, it it could have an impact, but most people on earth <laughs> have, have a smartphone already in their pocket, right? Some access to a computer or the internet. If they somehow shut down, down the internet in Russia, that could definitely become a problem. I, think. I don't think that will happen. But as long as people have access to self-custody wallets, they will be able to transact. And there's so many different ways that you can access uh, you know, a self-custodial wallet. 
whether it's on yourself or not. So I think uh, I think they'll be okay transacting for now, unless, like I said, some unprecedented event happens and they and they shut off the entire internet or something. Starlink has come into effect. That's right. Uh, Elon unleashed the Starlink onto the Ukrainian people, allowing them to have communications when before maybe it would have been a little tougher for them to have those communications. I think what I first want to do is talk about what you were saying. Uh, I was just watching the news. I don't even know which station or what channel it was. And these are some pretty brave people uh, somewhere in Russia. And they were saying that they're very against this invasion They were going to go and uh, attend at 7 o'clock Russian time a a protest against the Ukrainian invasion. And all of the people that they were talking to looked like that they were below the age of 40, which is like the target crypto audience, as you know. I mean, these people are very brave, considering that being, I think, outspoken against the conflict is not something that's probably, you know, shined upon. It's something that's obviously frowned upon. But... As you know, on Twitter, Mikhailo Fedorov wrote to Jesse Powell on, uh, it's an open letter on, or an open tweet <laughs> that anyone can read. And he wrote it to Jesse Powell, who's the co-founder of the Kraken Exchange, a crypto exchange. He said that he's asking all major crypto exchanges to block the addresses of Russian users. And he said it's crucial to freeze not only the addresses linked to Russian and Belarusian politicians, but also to sabotage ordinary users. And Jesse gave a very succinct response, which I will, I'm going to give a synopsis of what his answer was. He basically said, look, I have deep respect for the Ukrainian people, but Kraken can't punish all of our Russian clients because unless the country themselves, their own government requests that they can't be seen to be doing that because he then gives an example. If we're going to voluntarily freeze financial accounts of residents of countries who unjustly attack and provoke violence around the world, then he would have to freeze all U.S. accounts. (laughs) And as a practical matter, that's not a viable business option. So I would just like to get your take on that response. I tend to agree with Jesse in this uh, regard. You know, similarly, Jesse's been very transparent about what can and has to be done as a regulated exchange um, even with the Canadian trucker situation you know he said if, if the government asks we have to abide by you know their rulings and similarly here right the governments of the world have not asked them or have no real jurisdiction over the, the freezing of these accounts that are just ordinary people right? Maybe, yes, some are the actual Russian and Belarusian politicians. However, people that, that use Kraken who are Russian are just average, everyday people trading crypto. And as he says, if he's if he's going to shut down Russia, then he'd have to shut down every non-sanctioned country on Earth who has attacked someone unprovoked. There's some tenets that crypto is built upon, despite you know Kraken being a custodial exchange. Crypto is meant to be owned by the the user, right? The person, you kind of being your own bank or whatever, however you want to put it, until you commit a crime, you should have access to that money. So I, I tend to agree with Jesse on this one, to be honest. Your project, when you go on to the website for your project, it says pretty much in big, bold letters that the future of finance starts now and that you have a platform where you want to help the next generation of the digital economy. You want to create this next generation of the digital economy. Does it need to have stability? Do you need to have stability in the world in order to create the next generation of the digital economy? No, not at all. I mean, the the greatest innovations of our history have often been born of necessity, right? Even Bitcoin was born out of, and of course it was being developed far beyond and before this, but out of the financial crisis in 2008, right? A financial system that's borderless and uh, trustless and owned by those who who create unregulated by any central party, right? That was a necessity that we are now seeing the benefit of, right? I think this is just another large-scale revolution, in this case, technical, 
um, industrial in many ways. So, no, I don't think there needs to be stability. In fact, I think it, it drives innovation more so uh, when there's times of unrest. And it is very true. I think necessity and absolute upheaval is the mother of invention. Um, yeah. it, you know, it's uh, it definitely makes the juices flow in the brain a little bit faster. So <laughs> I understand exactly what Divi does. Absolutely. So Divi was born out of also necessity. We were cryptocurrency investors and users in the early days. I've been in crypto since, well, I mined my first Bitcoin in 2013, but I, I really didn't get into it until 2015 uh, when I started investing in, in Ethereum. But I realized and, and the team realized that I built Divi that there was a, a stark difference in user experience between cryptocurrency applications and regular applications, the regular web too and, and mobile applications that existed. And we felt that a company or a project that simplifies uh, the complexities in any space often uh, becomes very successful and can generate adoption of that technology. And we've seen that with Tesla, with Apple, with a lot of different companies throughout the years, right? So we built functions within crypto, make them simple and, and to everyone, but without sacrificing the decentralization, right? You can make a sacrifice of decentralization and go to market quickly with something that is potentially more familiarized, but you lose the whole point of crypto in general, right? A custodial solution is not, in my opinion, what blockchain and cryptocurrency is about. And we've made sacrifices as users of other technologies, like with Facebook, we sacrificed our privacy for the convenience of connection. I don't think it's wise to sacrifice the ownership of our money. This is like the final frontier of technology. I don't think it's wise to sacrifice that convenience. And, and that's kind of why we built Divi. So I was looking at your community because your community is very much in, there's a lot of community members, it seems, in areas of the world where banking the unbanked is a very important way to live you know i mean you need money to live anyone who thinks any other way really has to be living off the grid in the bush or the desert and <laughs> you know i you need money to live period but Absolutely. you you do have heavy community following it seems in areas like bangladesh and kenya and venezuela ghana and of course you also do have what are deemed as first world countries there too but you do seem to have a heavy footprint in areas where they are in need of a better financial system. So how did that come about? You know, we have developed our user experience around the accessibility framework, uh, frame of mind, I should say, to the point where you, you shouldn't need any prior knowledge, right? Any um, technical knowledge in order to interact with uh, technology especially technology that is uh, based around finance, right, which, as you mentioned, is an absolute necessity. So we've we've developed everything with that in mind. You know, things are very familiar, not too text-heavy, not a lot of jargon. It's just something that anyone can pick up and play with. And we offer the ability to earn interest on your cryptocurrency, which is very attractive. It's a very low barrier to entry uh, opportunity. It's proof of state blockchain. And that's attractive to, well, everyone. But, of course, people who have low incomes and things like that, um, to earn even a modest amount of any money is something that's a novel concept to a lot of these places. So um, I think that attracts people as well. And in Venezuela, I think it's probably the best example. You know, they their government basically hyperinflated their boulevards worthless. So they, again, out of oil, found necessity. And there are places in Venezuela where they have full circular Divi economies where you can go buy cereal and, and, uh, and milk and things like that with Divi. And they actually use our staking and masternode opportunity to supply villages with, uh, with food every single week. It's a beautiful thing, actually. So, again, it's just, it's just an easy, accessible thing that seems to work for people. So what did you think when the IMF warned against using crypto as a national currency in ahead of the El Salvador launch. What did you think about that? <laughs> you know, the powers that be, so to speak, the IMF in this case, they've ignored crypto for so long thinking that it would just disappear to be an issue. And it did. It became, <laughs> it became more and more powerful over time. So the IMF's response is in many ways just posturing, protecting the status quo, 
trying to ensure that their interests are, you know, protected, being, you know, the U.S. dollar, the reserve currency and all that. But ultimately, again, the only thing that regulates this technology is the code it's built upon. So they can say whatever they want, but, you know, Naive is building an actual city around Bitcoin using his volcano to mine it. Like, you, you can't stop it. <laughs> yeah. no matter no matter how mad, mad you might be as a as a three letter agency the technology just doesn't it doesn't quit is your blockchain proprietary did you guys write it from scratch or are you using somebody else's code so our big our blockchain is ultimately a fork of bitcoin we've modified it in pretty much every way but it's you know we've moved it to prove proof of stake it's secured by by masternodes, which were a really popular thing back in 2017 and 18. So it's it's very different. We, our block sizes are bigger, block time is faster, things like that. Uh, but it is a layer one that is a UTXO blockchain, just like just like Bitcoin. Excellent. So explain what a UTXO is. Absolutely, great question. So a UTXO is just an unspent transaction output. This is how blockchains like Bitcoin operate. To give you a, a parallel or a converse, Ethereum blockchain is an account-based system. UTXOs work in that so if I have one Bitcoin in my wallet, I have one unspent transaction output of one Bitcoin, and I send you 0.5 Bitcoin, you will now have an unspent transaction output of 0.5, and I will have a change address uh, receive the 0.5 remainder on my end and a new unspent transaction output will be created, right? So it's kind of complicated, but it helps to anonymize things, unlike the features account-based, which is way more auditable, I guess, um, in that you know every transaction is sent from the same account. That is absolutely a brilliant explanation. Now, one other thing, since we're talking about acronyms, is that your soon-to-be-launched SDK will allow for interoperability with other blockchains and integration with third-party apps. Explain to our listeners what an SDK is. Sure. Yeah, so an SDK is a software development kit. We're building Divi to, of course, be interoperable. The first step toward that is um, actually bridging to Ethereum. So we'll have a wrapped coin, which is the one-to-one representation of Divi on the Ethereum blockchain. That will enable users to do all the things on Ethereum that, that are super fun, like FTs and DeFi and whatnot. We'll continue to bridge to these other chains uh, in an effort to expose Divi to new users and expose our current users to new opportunities using Divi. Ultimately, though, the goal is to create, I don't really like the term SDK, which is really a toolkit, but what we're really trying to do is build like a vertical software as a service product that enables people to leverage the Divi wallet, the Divi blockchain, and all of the applications within the ecosystem for whatever they want to do. We've had a lot of uh, enterprises come to us recently and say, hey, we need a wallet in our application. It's it's a new thing, actually, for us. Um, people wanting to integrate a crypto wallet into a variety of services that we didn't really anticipate. And we want to enable that at, a, at scale. So that's kind of where that, that concept is, is driving. Well, you do know that you own this website. If you don't like the term SDK, you can get rid of it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can do that. I'm, and I'm sure you've got the power in your fingers to just snap I, I them. Might, I might be able to do something about that. <laughs> you, know, you never know. Or you can ask Santa either way. In terms of DeFi or GameFi, more acronyms that we throw out. But, you know, I've done about three episodes now where I've talked about GameFi. And we basically put the word FI on everything now. Uh, the, the hottest new words, GameFi and Metaverse, communities are exploding within those areas. I mean, obviously DeFi is but you know, that's long in the tooth now. Bitcoin's only been around for like, what, two days on the scale of, of everything else. <laughs> but, you know, it has been going on for some time. Is Divi an enabler for people within the gaming and DeFi sectors? Absolutely. I mean, that's a big part of why we're aiming to bridge to these different chains. For me, at least, DeFi is a step in the right direction it makes a lot of sense in uh in the context of cryptocurrency right it enables people to become their own market maker and their own lender and do things that don't necessarily require a third party use utilizing smart contracts of course we see these things fail constantly it's very nascent it's new and there's still a lot of bad actors in that space 
but being that, you know, we've tried to build a, an enterprise around trust and reliability, you know, I hope that we can bring forth some products that are ethically bound to the standards that we would, you know, hold ourselves to. We are working towards that. Absolutely. Well, you know, ethics and morals are two things that I love to talk about and which I am very severe on in terms of my own personal beliefs and how we should be acting within this space. Because I've been a hardcore believer in the Satoshi vision since day one. It's what everything hinges on. And of course, it's not what every human hinges on because there's been a lot of players in the DeFi and now gaming space who have broken the trust. We have now seen the SEC doing one of the most profound rulemaking leaps that they've done in the longest time. I mean, I said this on many podcasts. We're about to see the hammer come down. Thor's hammer is going to come down because Gary Gensler, to me, he wants to try and be pro-crypto. I I don't know. You know, I'm good at reading people. I'm definitely good at reading them over just a microphone. He's been looking at taking on the crypto industry since he started like last April. They're right now in the comment period for this new, I guess it would be a new law that would come into play where anyone who's working on anything that looks like a DeFi project, a DeFi protocol, and this is a wide, this is a very wide and broad definition needs to register with the SEC. And that, by the way, will include the people who wrote the software who are no longer part of that protocol or that company. (laughs) So this is a pretty big piece of legislation. Now, were you aware of that? And regardless if you're aware or not, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I I try to watch what's happening at the SEC (laughs) pretty closely for obvious reasons. Um, Gary... You know, he's trying to make a name for himself. He was big on Wall Street. He's taught at MIT and stuff like that. Interestingly, he taught a blockchain course at MIT. Yet, he still seems to legislate in a way that's misdirected and doesn't really make sense in the context of the technology. I don't know if that law will come to fruition or not. I'm sure some iteration of it will eventually come to pass. All it serves to do is drive innovation offshore. It doesn't help anything, really. I mean, this is a potentially multi-trillion dollar industry. It already is a a trillion dollar industry, right? At at least by market cap. The world's entire financial system could be driven into this technology and that could benefit the U.S. who is, in every case, struggling financially uh, despite, you know, our pottering and everything. We're in trillions of dollars debt, right? Continuing to print money, 40% of the money supply was printed in the last two years. Mm -hmm. Bad. Bad, bad. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. um, and and Gary's operating under the guise of investor protection, which is a, clearly a joke as well. So my issue, I guess, with, with any of these legislative moves is that they're unfounded and not taking into consideration like the operational needs of, of technologies and companies. It's a concern. It's something that I think a lot of people in our space don't want to talk about, <laughs> kind of just like ignoring the elephant in the room. But uh, but it is a concern for sure. And what I hope is that the professionals in the space that have a wider reach than I do have the opportunity to at least speak to the the people that are writing these laws and hopefully direct traffic in the right direction. Well, you know, this is definitely going to be also a space to watch. There's too, so many spaces to watch. We all have to be insects. We need that eyes. But yeah. you hit the nail on the head because Gensler said that he does believe that crypto exchanges and crypto projects in general do need, they basically, the SEC needs to put out more protections for investors. And that is his main goal, saying why everything needs to be regulated by the SEC. And of course, enable for them to be able to do that, the SEC has to demonstrate that the assets exchanges are securities. And, um, and of course, that's until Congress acts and, and really gives a pure definition on all this stuff. It's it's a space that everybody has to watch. You have an excellent community in some of these countries where this whole thing of getting people to the whole financial system and banking the unbanked and getting people to use your product, your, you know, to getting people to use Divi, learning how to use crypto, it does still have, even today, a steep learning curve. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So... Knowing that this is something that people really can't pick up quickly, especially in moments of crisis, if I was somebody 
who called you or I DM'd you <laughs> on one of the social media platforms. And I said, listen, I need to do something right now because I have to leave the Ukraine. What's the quickest way for me to immerse myself into this thing called crypto and get into the system? Help me, help me. What would you say? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think it's important that, you know, the technologies that we do have right now, <clears throat> the on-ramps and such, are just built in a, such that they don't need <clears throat> too much education, right? We, we talk about education a lot as, as builders, like, oh, we need to educate, we need to educate. But in reality, you have to adapt to the user. You shouldn't make them learn new things. In fact, that's like the w rule number one <laughs> of, of building user experiences is like, don't force the user to learn a new system. Of course, crypto is ultimately, it's just another financial asset that operates similarly to Venmo or PayPal or whatever, things that people have used before. So I think it's more important that we are building things that are as easy to pick up and, and use as everything else that people are, are used to using. Now, if the person did want to enhance their knowledge, <laughs> there's tons of free resources out there. Start there. You know, that's probably the best way if you truly, truly want to learn how it works. But other than that, it's up to the builders. But how is it going to help somebody who's DMing, help me now, 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 what do I do? Because you know, transacting in crypto is a little bit like this, in my opinion, in some instances. I mean, it's I may be over exaggerating, but I'll get, uh, it's akin to this to somebody who's a technophobe. This is what it sounds like to a technophobe. Okay, you're going to learn to drive a car, but first, I want you to learn this. This is called the spark plug. <laughs> <laughs> now, what you need to do is put this spark plug into here. But before we do that, we're going to learn how to, how the engine works so you can build one before you drive the car. <laughs> so to some people who are, because everyone makes this assumption, because uh, of course, I have written a lot of courses and I've done a lot of educational work in this space. And people, for some reason, think that just because you're below 30 and know how to use Snapchat and TikTok, that you must be a tech genius. And people don't understand that that does not equate to just because you can use Snapchat and TikTok, you should be able to just immediately open up a, a wallet and start trading right away and, and getting into, into DeFi. And, you know, people, when you, it's just incredible that people who aren't of a certain mindset you know, they just stare at the others in the room and go, how do you not get this? It's so easy. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, it's I, I hang around with a lot of Sheldon Cooper-esque people, it, you know, because they're, those are the people who are, dare I say, building like you need for your Divi project. Those are the people who you need to build that future. And I was actually at a big stand at a conference and I was with a bunch of guys who, like I said, very Sheldon Cooper-esque. And, you know, I'm watching them try to explain people how to open wallets. And I'm thinking, we are beeped. And if this <laughs> is the way it's going to go. And that's why I started to write this series of books, which, which of course, uh, not just the books, but then do this podcast. Because, you know, we started to get, I started to get a lot of questions. And I went into the education space pretty seriously, especially because so many people got scammed. So I guess the question I, I want to really get with you is, how is Divi going to really set themselves apart from the rest of the projects out there and really make yourself user, user, user friendly? It's a great question and a very true uh, observation about the space. So, I mean, right from the moment that you download the Divi wallet and set it up as a user, you're not seeing a lot of the things that you might see in other crypto wallets where it's like bombarding you with jargon, write down the seed phrase, like things like that aren't part of our onboarding. In fact, the opposite is true. We onboard you in a way that says, hey, do you want to set up a username? Do you want to set up a phone number so people can just send you your number or an email, um, a, a, an avatar, things like that. Things that people are, again, familiar with when they're setting up applications. Once they're into the app, then we, of course, the first time you go to send or, or receive funds, then we say, hey, learn about a seed phrase. Like, this is how you secure your wallet, and if you ever lose it, this is how it works. But by then, you know, they're already set up with a wallet that works for Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, and, and Divi. 
um, and soon many others. Uh, so what to do is if they want to send money to their family member in Ukraine or, or Russia or Venezuela or wherever they are, is search their name or their phone number or their email. They're not learning about addresses or, and of course those things exist within the app, but they're, I don't say obfuscated, but just pushed to the background. Things that people don't need to understand are always in the background and things that people need for their lives uh, that adapt to the way that they use things are in the foreground. And that's kind of how we've differentiated our wallet. And, and the reason that I think a lot of, I mean, we have actual grandmothers and grandfathers using Divi and, and staking and things like that because it's that easy. Well, let's hope that it does remain that easy. What's happening in terms of investors and with what's going on in the Divi space in general? Is there something newsworthy, groundbreaking? Probably the biggest news recently was that we signed a partnership with the Spanish soccer league La Liga. Wow! And they're, yeah, very big deal. They're the biggest sports league on earth by viewership. So we're very excited about this partnership. It's very that is integrated, massive. symbiotic. Yeah, it's, thank you. Thanks. It's, it's really, um, we're really proud of it, especially being a smaller project. To, to close a deal at this scale is, is a big deal to us. Outside of that, we have a big release coming up at the end of this quarter which I guess is the end of this month, <laughs> where uh, users will have the ability to, to purchase crypto with a credit card or bank account, swap cryptos, and do a bunch of the things that you'd expect to see in, in most wallets, as well as uh, some DeFi stuff. So, yeah, just keep an eye out. Wait, 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 wait. Back up. Wait a minute. I'm doing Italian hands when I, see, when I say your name, and, but you've <laughs> got this huge deal with a humongous Spanish league. <laughs> yeah i mean uh everyone on earth watches soccer except a lot of people in the u.s i guess they have a lot of uh parallels in terms of the way that they operate and do business you know they interact with their community in a very holistic uh organic way they want to help people and they want to spread joy through the through the you know beauty of soccer to uh to as many people as possible they're actually in almost every country uh la liga broadcasting so our partnership puts us in 48 of those countries um, on the pitch uh, in, a, in a lot of games um, with players and we get to go in person and, and activate have people download the wallet We're actually talking about doing uh, this really cool thing at a hotel i think in in the middle east during a big event coming up uh, where people can actually book their hotel and spend money within the, or spend divvy within, within the property all as a part of our partnership with Lalia. So it's, it's really cool. Like I said, very symbiotic relationship. You know, first of all, where's my invite? <laughs> <laughs> That's number one. And number two, you know, I like the way, by the way, you said that. Oh yeah. I got like two things to tell you. So we have these like really cool things coming out soon. Oh, and also <laughs> I found like King Arthur's sword, but anyway, uh, other stuff. That, I don't know what else is going on. It's like, what? I sit in Europe, and I no one would talk like that. This is how they would start the broadcast with Italian hands. They'd go like this, Nick. <laughs> you won't believe this. We just signed a huge deal with La Liga. <laughs> Goal! You know, that's what they do. How did you end up partnering? Do you understand that, like, projects 50 times your size? I mean, you guys are, like minnows in the pond even though you're doing really well but now that you have this partnership with la liga how did that happen what happened were you sitting next to the guy on on emirates flight going somewhere what happened <laughs> uh almost almost that i mean so and, and it is a big deal we're very excited obviously about this partnership we were at a conference in dubai actually and we were approached by their head of partnerships for that region uh and he said, hey, we're looking for a crypto wallet, specifically a crypto wallet that has a coin, its own blockchain, right? So we fit that bill. But we're not, of course, like you mentioned, the only company that that bill. We had breakfast with Luis the next day and sort of made a, a light elevator pitch to him, tried to get him interested. And, and he liked us a lot. He liked our vision and it aligned in many ways with La Liga's vision and, and philosophy. So... He's like, I really love to work with you guys, but you do have some caution in, in bidding for this. <laughs> so uh, I left that meeting and I turned to my CMO and I said, I have no idea how we're ever going to land this. It would be awesome, but I'm skeptical that it's possible. So she said, nope, just leave it with me. And they made this beautiful deck. Our CMO has worked with 
some pretty big companies in the past, Samsung, and they've done the Heineken World Cup for rugby and things like that. So they have some experience in, in landing deals of this nature. So I left it with her, and the next thing I knew, I was flying to Spain to sign the biggest contract of my life. <laughs> uh, and it was it was cool. Cool. I mean, so what, do you get like a box at, like in every game or what? We get many games, and, and since you're in Europe, we'd love to have you out next time we're over there uh, at a game. Um, don't tease me. Yeah, we get don't to, tease me, Nick. No, no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm dead serious. You come out. I'd love to have you there. Um, yeah, I mean, we pretty much we can go to any game we want for, for the next three and a half years. Um, but it's, it's beyond that, right? It, it's, it enables us to activate in person with the players, with the fans, you know, the people that are diehard about La Liga and about, about Spanish football. And that, to me, is probably the, the bigger part of this partnership. Like, it's cool to have our, our logo on the pitch and things like that. But actually being able to demonstrate what the power of cryptocurrency is in person with people and, and make it, as we've talked about in this podcast, adapt to their lifestyle by allowing them to buy a beer at the stadium with with Divi um, or book a hotel with Divi, you know, um, showing them like this can work in the real world in your hand. And uh, and that's powerful. Nick, you're a god. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, you're so weird. I love it. So wait a minute. So, uh, weirdest guy I've had in the last month. Okay, that's something. I'm I'm proud of that. That's you should. Cool. You, that's a T-shirt I'll make you. So okay. So let me <laughs> let me ask you this. So what else do you have coming out soon? Yes. Yeah, so the the next release of our mobile wallet is. One of the biggest and most anticipated, and, you know, it has on ramp, which is probably the most highly recommended or requested um, feature that our users have. It'll have the ability to swap cryptos, uh, 270 assets right in the wallet. A lot of enhancements to the to the user experience and the staking experience and things like that. So we're we're really excited for this release because it basically establishes the wallet as something that's you know aligned with the rest of the industry and incorporates all the IP that, you know, we have built proprietary into our ecosystem. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a big one for sure. Nick, I, I have to tell you, first of all, I, I would love to have you back on to crypto and blockchain talk again. And that has nothing to do with the fact that you said I could come to a La Liga game because you know, <laughs> these are separate things. I would love to have you back on to crypto and blockchain talk again. Would you come? Absolutely. I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> Not as much as me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's first do this. Uh, Nick, I'd like to thank you so much for coming on to this week's edition of Crypto and Blockchain Talk. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I'm very proud of you for capturing, I would say, probably one of the most coveted contracts in the world. Thank you. That means a lot. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Low key, you are. Your girlfriend must be like you. you must be like this. Surprise, honey! I bought you <laughs> a five thousand carat ring, and we're going to St. Barts in a private jet. <laughs> I mean, wow! Talk about laid back. Seriously, Nick, it was a sheer pleasure to have you on. I would like to also tell all of our listeners that nothing that Nick and I have talked about today can possibly be construed as investment advice. If you have any questions, you must do your own homework, do your own research, do your own due diligence, and hire your own personal financial advisor to steer you through this whole maze that is known as the world of crypto and blockchain. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of our listeners for tuning in. Please ask your friends and family to tune into this week's Crypto and Blockchain Talk, which is broadcast on over 70 different podcasting platforms. The full list on CryptoAndBlockchainTalk.com. Furthermore, this gorgeous podcast is also available on our radio station, Crypto24Radio.com. Crypto24Radio.com broadcasts 24-7 around the world, playing news, music, and more. We also have our social media channels of Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So if you want to communicate with us, it's very easy. Just go through one of those channels. But otherwise, our preferred method of communication is, of course, email. And if you're a long-term listener, you know that most of all. So please email us at education at savvy. That's education at savvy, S-A-V-I-I -I, digital dot com. Again, education at savvy, S-A-V-I-I -I, digital dot com. Again, thank you for tuning in. 
We know that your time is valuable. So when you tune into us, it means the world. So please be safe. Take care and goodbye for now. Mm-hmm.